and the quiche. I want to illustrate basically uh, what we were up against in terms of a message for the quiche Indians. And I think this will serve as an illustration and as, as a springboard for the way that we might present a message more effectively to, uh, to the people of our own uh, community and our own culture. Guatemala is a country of about 7 million people. It's 50% Indian. The largest group are the Quiche, 500,000 strong. Some people say 600,000. Approximately 90% illiterate. Of those 10% who can read and write, they can only read and write in Spanish. They do not know how to read and write in their own language of Quiche. 80% of the people live two to four hours from the nearest road. They live in the sticks, in the backwoods. It's not an Indian reservation. There are no bows and arrows. Uh, these people were living in the central highlands of Guatemala 2,000 years ago. That's home. They joke about falling out of their cornfield and killing themselves. And the reason they joke about that is because their cornfields are on 60-degree slopes, and they farm them with a hoe that's about a foot wide and about a foot tall and very heavy, and that's their, they joke about their tractors, and that's their tractor, that hoe that they use to cultivate the hillsides. Subsistence-level farmers growing corn and beans and squash and they grow enough to barely get them through the year. They make their spending money down on the coast and the coffee plantations going down there two and three months out of a year to earn $3 a day for you know 14 or more hours work. So these are the people, Guatemala is the first country south of Mexico, and these are the people that we minister to. And I want to take just a few minutes here, and uh, we've got more or less the, the geographical setting. We want to go ahead here and work on uh, what these people, how they, they function. Can we turn those over at the right time? There's supposed to be somebody here to do it, so you to do it for you. Okay, fine. Uh, okay, now then, uh, somebody remind me in case that thing clicks and I don't hear it uh, to turn the tape over. It won't click. You have one page that has an hour. Oh, okay. You start the other one, 30 minutes later. This man's supposed to be in there, I'm getting Okay, I've got both tapes going now. Do I need it? I wonder why we're being recording too. For the Kiche Indians. Whoops. There we go. This one starts 30 minutes later. All right. All right. All right. Thank you. Uh, the Indian, the Quiche Indians believe that the world is round, like a tortilla. <laughs> and they're at the center of the universe, as one Quiche Indian asked once, is this the only place in the world where Quiche is spoken? And the missionary said, yeah, there's no other place in the world where they speak Quiche. And he said, well, that's right, us being here at the center of the world, this ought to be the only place where Quiche is spoken. Sure. They believe that the world is, that Guatemala is surrounded by water on all sides. Oh, Sorry. Me that uh, Guatemala is surrounded by water on all sides, and uh, this is where they live and operate and explain all of their world, everything they need to know, can be explained in terms of their little community. And their little community is where a pure quiche is spoken. Over in the next village, they kind of corrupt it a little bit, but where they are, that's the true quiche. Now then, uh, underneath this world is the world of the dead. In the world of the dead, there's a courthouse. Because up here in the real world, every community, just about no matter how small, has a courthouse. It's a men's meeting area where the men get to read together and run the community. And the world of the dead, as these men go to, uh, as people die and migrate to the world of the dead, then the leaders of the leaders then become in charge of the courthouse here in the world of the dead. There's a jail where people are, are put, uh, that have done bad things in this life, you're put in jail here in the world of the dead. The sun, which comes up over here and travels around during the daytime, comes to the world of the dead so that when it's nighttime here, it's daytime in the world of the dead. That's the way you need to get your geography straight. You know, this is the way things really work. Now then, um, in this situation here, let's say someone up in this, in uh, the world as we know it, thinks that his neighbor is moving his land boundaries. They're moving the, the rocks that mark the boundaries of his land. They're trying to cheat him out of his land. He goes and 
does what's called crying before the ancestors. He pleads his case in the courthouse. He gets a witch doctor, hires a witch doctor. The witch doctor, through chants and incantations, calls up people from the world of the dead. He makes his plea before the world of the dead. All right, they have a session down here in the courthouse, and they decide the case. And they send messengers back to the world of the living. The messenger is the owl. And if you hear an owl crying outside your house, someone in your family is going to die. They've been called to court. They've been given a subpoena. And the way you appear in the world of the dead is, of course, to die. You plead your case in the world of the dead. If you can reverse the decision, then they send the owls after the guy who gave them this information. So there is some control over the situation. But uh, uh, the ancestors come back to visit All Saints Day. You know, Halloween, this is where Halloween comes from. That's the day when all of the saints, when the people in the world of the dead come back to visit. And you put out offerings of food, offerings of liquor, cigars, cigarettes, <coughs> flower petals, decorate your house up, sweep off the patio, because grandmother and granddad are coming home. And that's the celebration of All Saints Day, or Halloween as we come to know it here. That's where all the spooks come from. It's a very happy occasion for them. Now, then, in the community itself, there are people who serve as first mayor, second mayor, third mayor, first register, second register, syndicate, and then the auxiliary mayors that I mentioned this morning who serve sort of as policemen and errand boys. Uh, you move up in position through the community over the years in the community, serving in these different positions. Uh, they have the saints inside the Catholic Church building that are taken care of by similar types of organizations. And as you move through these steps of organization, you lose everything you own in terms of finances. Because this, you serve for a year for free. At the end of the year, you're broke, but you've got status. So this is the way you distribute the goods throughout the community as you get rich. This is a socially acceptable way of getting rid of excess wealth in a closed-faced society in a, in a limited, uh, the theory of limited good. Uh, if anyone that gets rich gets rich at the expense of everyone else. So a socially acceptable way of getting rid of that riches is to serve here in one of these positions. Uh, these are the men that are respected in the community. They paid a tremendous price in order to get this respect. In order for the church to grow, these are the guys you need as your, as your peer leaders, as the guys who are going to do something. But you see, they got everything to lose and nothing to gain. They paid the price. They have their acceptance and their prestige, and then you're trying to talk them out of it. So uh, the guys you need are the guys least likely to respond. Now, in addition to all of these fellows uh, and, and these factors, there are a wealth of evil spirits. Theo, uh, to kill. Cold darkness. Cold wind. And uh, that's one of the evil spirits. Then there's Porazum. Uh, I'm giving you these names just to, to show you that it's kind of, I mean, there's some weird stuff. Now then, when we first moved in the Indian community, the second mayor came by, this guy right here, and said, you know what everybody in the community thinks about you? And I thought, they want us to meet, and they want to hear the gospel. They know we're here. They, the word's out, we're here. And he said, uh, what they think of you is that you're an evil spirit. And I said, no, man, I'm a graduate of Harding Graduate School, you know. <laughs> That's a contradiction in terms to talk about me being an evil spirit. So, uh, no, he said, I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, there's a spirit here that's a perfectly normal person in the daytime, but at night he goes out and does three somersaults in one direction, then three somersaults in another direction. Do you realize what you formed when you do that? Henry knows. You form the cross. Three somersaults this way, three this way, and on the last one, you turn into an animal, a rat, a snake, a cat, a dog. And then you go around the community looking for babies because babies' souls are not firmly attached. They don't know their home. And as a huratzum, you can pull out the soul and eat it. That's where you get your nourishment. Or you find a sick person whose soul knows it's going to be leaving its home pretty soon and you can pull that soul out. And then before daylight, then you've changed yourself back into a normal human being. And you see... Look at all that hair, man. You're half animal already. Look at that, man. You proved it, you know. And uh, because they don't have a lot of facial hair, you know, they don't have, they're pretty smooth-skinned people. And here you are, half animal already. And I said, okay, give me the word. I want to tell them that I am not one of those animals. I am not 
And he said, well, you would say, and so I learned how to say that. But he said, you can't say that because these guys are liars. <laughs> and there are a lot of people that are not sure. But what if you went around the community saying, I am not a Huratzum? You know your own name, so you prove that you are. Who else would know their name besides one of these guys? I mean, they're not sure right now. They think you're one. But you go around telling them you're not, and you'll confirm it to everybody you talk to. Again, this feeling of helplessness, of being a bad egg and knowing you're not, and nothing you can do to straighten it other than live a life of service to try and change it. And yet not knowing what service is, you don't know when to stand up, you don't know when to sit down. You give them a bag of peanuts. I remember one time handing a good guy a bag of peanuts. I said, would you like some peanuts? So he takes the bag of peanuts, dumps the whole sack in his sack, and hands me back an empty sack. I thought, you greedy Indian. Just because I'm a gringo, you're taking advantage of me. But it was merely the fact that you always hand people the amount you want them to have. That's their culture. You want them to have the whole bag, you hand the whole bag. You want to have a handful, you hand them a handful. That's the way they do things. And so you didn't know when to say thank you. You didn't know when to say no thank you. They offer you something. You don't know if you refuse twice and then accept it or if you refuse three times and then you accept it or if you don't accept it at all or if you accept it the first time. And it's not a situation where you can say, I just won't do anything because not doing anything is wrong. There is no way to win. You just have to make mistakes and ask questions and be sensitive and try to learn. Now then... Uh, so they thought we were these evil spirits, and then we found out there was a raft of evil spirits. They were afraid of these evil spirits. Uh, I've already mentioned about the Catholic saints that were heirlooms. Henry here might be able to, to tell us about the fear that people have of handling these things that, for their worldview, are live. So you have to learn a whole different system of what's live and what's not live, what's animate and what's inanimate. And saints in Quiche are animate. They have a soul. And that soul must be fed by the soul of a candle. It takes a white candle made out of uh, wax, paraffin, in order to light the way from the world of the dead. And it takes a yellow candle made out of animal tallow for nourishment. You may be, can you fill us in on some of this? I, uh, in his experience in, in Miami and being involved with some, uh, uh, some witchcraft there, uh, when we were talking earlier today, you mentioned, Henry, about uh, the fear that people have of handling these sacred objects. They have a, they have a fear because they, they, they feel that it's true. Uh, most of the people that, that are into this thing are strong people uh, in society. And they're gangsters or they're into uh, other things. Uh, they, they feel that the spirits are like radio waves. And they're like radio waves. That we need, like you said, food and drinks and tobacco uh, <coughs> right. to attract them. And once you're attracted them to your house, then you can do just about anything Right. Uh -huh. Okay. And when it comes time to, uh, to get rid of these, when you, when you make some sort of a decision, that's a fearful thing. Most people in that condition of just coming to faith are still afraid to even touch them or handle them. You know, it's, it's difficult for them to come to the belief that these things are not, are not uh, real. That, uh, as Paul says, we know that an idol is just a hunk of wood. But let's not forget that it's in league with evil spirits and that the evil spirits are lurking there. There is a saint in uh, Guatemala called San Simon. His other name is Saint Judas. You see, you don't know the real story of what happened to the crucifixion. Judas repented of his sin and the Lord blessed the 30 pieces of money and since that time he's been helping poor people. And his image is in the town of Zunil. Uh, Cynthia's been to Zunil and probably seen uh, San Simon. And Saint Simon is a mannequin with a wooden mask and sits in a chair. And I have seen women on their knees, tears streaming down their face, stroking the back of St. Simon, whispering in his ear what they need. Oh, St. Simon, you know, my, my daughter is sick. Can you cure my daughter? And uh, it's a hard, you don't know whether to laugh or cry at the, the, the superstition that the people are wrapped up in. And one of the greatest breakthroughs I think we had in working among the Quiche people was to accept the fact that the people believed that. They really did. And not to get a condescending smile on your face when you talk to them about it, not to make fun of them, not to criticize them. But when you go into an Indian home, I remember the breakthrough when 
I was sitting around talking with a fellow, and I just couldn't believe that this guy believed some of that. I knew Indians did, but not this guy. And it was always, but not this guy. And I never could get around to the specifics. And then finally, I remember talking one day to a fellow and saying, can you tell me about the saint on the table? What's his specialty? What's he really good at? I didn't imply that I necessarily believed it. He knew that I didn't believe it, but I was willing to believe that he did and accept it and help him work through it. But the information that I got out of that, out of that context, um, we're drifting a little bit here. Let's get on back to this so we can cut it off and then begin to look at some sort of a message in this situation. Uh, the main God that the people are wrapped up in is the world God, whose name in Quiche is uh, Hill Plain. Describing the topography of Guatemala. And every mountain has what's called an owner. And inside that hill lives a spirit. And you can prove this scientifically, that these gods are the ones that cause rain. If you've ever been to Guatemala, if you've ever seen pictures of it in uh, National Geographic, you notice that there are clouds that are laced around the mountains. The most characteristic sign of it is like the Smoky Mountains in uh, West Virginia, the clouds that are laced around the mountains. And we all know that rain comes from clouds. And you all know that corn can't grow without rain. And so here you have an owner inside a mountain. This is uh, Seven Ears Mountain. This is Lion Head Mountain. This is Dancing Place Mountain. And inside of each one of these is an owner that's a part or an essence of the world God. And they call the clouds around the mountains. That's why they gather. And thunder, the word for thunder in Quiche is the mountains are speaking. And as the mountains begin to thunder, as the owner thunders and talks, then he calls the clouds to him. And as the clouds then begin to gather around the mountain, that's where the rain comes from. Now then, you start talking about positive and negatively charged clouds producing thunder. Can you see the problem? You know, this is so much more believable. Even to me, <laughs> this is this makes, this is scientific. This this makes sense. I had an Indian one day that I was talking to a seventy-year-old fellow, respected member of the community, and he said, uh, "What do they make in Momos Tenango?" And I said, "In Momos Tenango, they make blankets." He said, "What do they make in Nawala?" And I said, "In Nawala, they make the stone corn grinder." And he said, what do they make down on the coast? Well, that's where the coffee grows. And what do they make in Salcaja? That's where they weave the skirts for the, for the native dress of the women. He named off several communities and asked me what was their specialty in each community. And I was pleased, you know, that I knew so much about the people that I could give him. I just fell for it, hook, line, and sinker, and just told him, you know, the specialty of each one of the areas. And then he said, and what you're telling me then is that you've got a guy that does it all. When life shows us that each one has its specialty. And that's why there's a God for rain. And that's why there's one for cursing. That's why there's one for getting curses off. That's why there's one for evil eye. And that's why each one has his own specialty. And you're trying to tell me there's one guy that's in charge of the whole shooting match. And life just isn't that way. You know, these backwoods pagans are not as easy to deal with as we sometimes would like to assume. They're not sitting on the edge of their seat waiting for a preacher to come by and tell them about Jesus. They have a system that fits together and a system that works, but a system that is full of evil, a system that leaves them lost, a system that leaves them isolated, a system that leaves them with what I would call felt needs. This is not preaching a self-centered message to preach to the needs that these people feel. It's not self-centered. It's our expression that I really am concerned about where you're hurting. Not just physically, but emotionally and socially. I want to know where you hurt. And one of the places where these people were really hurting was in terms of all of these evil spirits. And our difficulty was coming up with some sort of a message they could preach with any kind of, with some kind of power and conviction that would say that, that Jesus has power over evil spirits. When you have a guy with bloody dysentery, 
And he says it's because the witch doctor has placed a frog in his stomach that is eating his heart out and causing the, the sickness. And you know what he needs is, uh, Cynthia could tell us, how many milligrams of tetracycline in order to get that situation straightened up. Then what do you preach? What do you say? Our Western backgrounds get in the way. We have been secularized out of belief in the power of God and in that, that stuff like this exists. I'm not saying that I would not give the fellow tetracycline, but it's going to take more than tetracycline for him to feel like he's treated. Their whole concept is that sin equals sickness, and sickness equals sin. And if you're sick, it's because of some specific sin in your life that you've committed that you have to get forgiveness for. It's not confession of sin in general that I'm a sinner. It's confession of, I wonder if it was that time I went into Guatemala City and uh, shacked up with this woman. I wonder, I wonder if that's why I'm sick. And so you confess that one. Okay, if that doesn't straighten it up, well, maybe it was a time and I stole my neighbor's firewood. Maybe that's what's up. So you confess that one. If you get well, okay, that's probably what it was. And you go to a witch doctor in order to divine the cause of sickness. And the doctor says, no, I know why you're sick. It's because of bacteria. The Indian's question is much more fundamental and much more biblical. Where did the bacteria come from? Why did it pick on me? You see, we stop much too short with our Western secularism and our Western scientific approach. They, these people are asking much more basic questions. Someone asked once concerning this fellow who had a frog in his stomach. He said, if you can give the Freudian psychological term for what that guy's mixed up with, <coughs> if he dies, does it make any difference whether you call it a frog in the stomach or whether you can give the Freudian psychological term? Does it really make any difference? If you haven't got anything to offer him, if you can't meet that felt need, does it make any difference what you call it? Now then, uh, let me stop just for a minute here and get your reaction, if you have a reaction, uh, to preaching a message that says that Jesus has power over evil spirits. Yes. I know he probably been asked this a hundred times. Isn't this really the kind of world that Jesus walked in? Is it, yes. Is there not a similarity of what Jesus did in John 9 with the blind man Yes, right. John, uh, that very passage in John was very, very useful. Also the one in Mark 2 where Jesus forgave not only the man's, not only cured the sickness, but forgave his sin. Forgave his sin first, and then uh, cured him first, and then, you know, forgave his sin. You know, it was tied in together as a tight package. And I think this is the message that has to be preached. Uh, the world of the New Testament is much closer to the world the Indians are living in than our Western secularism. There was an example from a book called Practical Anthropology, a magazine, uh, a periodical uh, that's since discontinued, uh, about uh, Jacob Lowen working among the Choco Indians in Panama. They translated the passage in James because the preacher's wife had malaria. The passage in James, it says, call in the elders of the church and pray for the sick and they'll be cured. And he had trouble translating that passage because he's afraid they're going to take it literally. Uh, if you get the implication. And uh, he translated it, gave it to them, and attended the first prayer meeting. And then he heard later that they had a second prayer meeting. But they didn't call him. And he asked them about it, and their answer was, the passage says the prayer of faith will cure. And we sense that you didn't believe. So... Our Western secularism gets in the way, and, and you can't hide it. These people can see through that sham. And uh, they have to put their faith and their trust in Jesus. This is what faith is, confidence in Jesus. It's not confidence in the images anymore. It's not confidence in the witch doctors. Your confidence and your trust, your hope, is based on Jesus. I'm often asked the question, what do these people know about God's grace? And my answer is very little in terms of being able to write term papers on it. Very much in terms of having to live by it every day. They live by grace. That's the only way they can operate as Christians. So, you know, they are people who, are, who know about grace firsthand because their confidence is in Jesus. So the message that was preached was a message basically that Jesus has power over evil spirits. But even there, like an Indian asked once, Oh, boy, that sounds good. Tell me the secret words. You know, just another chant. Just another incantation. 
you know, miscommunication. So you have to go back and, and rehone it and redefine it. And it's still the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. That is still the core of the message, but it's related back to where the people are hurting. The resurrection is the sign that Jesus won over evil spirits. You preach resurrection as the sign that Jesus has control over evil spirits. I remember using the illustration of a man and his enemy that get in a fight and, and with their machetes, one guy cuts the other guy's head off. And he throws the body down a ravine. And then three days later, he's walking down the trail and here comes this man walking toward him and his head's back on. What's he going to do? He's going to turn and run. Scared to death. What in the world is going on? And that's what you find with the evil spirits. That they tried to do Jesus in, and they could not do it. He has the victory, and they are afraid of Jesus if you'll put your faith and your trust and your confidence in him. But it's a matter of commitment. Yes? Good question. <laughs> Good Before question. you go to that, uh, yes. you give us your insight on Romans 1, 18, the end of the chapter, in light of your experience down there. Uh, you have to refresh my memory of that particular uh, section. God revealed because of the exchange of glory of God. So all okay. Things. All right. Yeah, this is... Uh, you think of... Uh, some people are still operating on the idea of a noble savage. You know, that went out at the end of the 1900s, you know, at the end of uh, the 1800s. That, that's long gone. No anthropologist believes that kind of stuff anymore. Backyard anthropologists believe in it, that you know, you're corrupting these Indians, that they've got a, a pure, quiet, tranquil type of life. These communities in Guatemala are just rank and riddled with sorcery and counter-sorcery and suspicion and envy and hate. And it's there, and it breaks out every year at fiesta time when they have the, you know, the big yearly blowout in honor of the Catholic saint, when everybody gets drunk, you know, there's somebody killed every year, there's somebody beat up every year, there are people thrown into jail, adultery all over the place. You know, it's, it's corrupt. There, there's no, you know, exactly what you're saying you know, in Romans. That's the end product. And it's not hard to show that, you know, they're in the hands of the devil. One of the most effective messages was concerning uh, Holy Week, when on Friday they celebrate the death of Jesus and everybody gets drunk. And they get drunk on Saturday, and Sunday morning they're sleeping it off. And you know, this is the sign that you're in the hands of the devil. He'll let you celebrate the death, but he keeps you in the dark about the resurrection because the resurrection is a sign that he's, he's over with, he's finished, he's through. So you sleep it off on Sunday, and you don't even know he was resurrected. And you get drunk celebrating his death, but you don't know the resurrection. Okay, now your question is uh, uh, a real challenge. And... Uh, I hope it's you know I hope it's not a cop out to say that I don't I don't have all of the answers. I think some of you would have a lot more answers about this than I do. I want to underline just a little bit more on the methodology, and then I want to to come back to that question and deal with it. Uh, some people react and say, you know, preaching to felt needs. Uh, the need is that the guy is a sinner. That's his need. Okay, that's true. But see, this is from God's viewpoint. And this is what's true in terms of uh, ultimate reality. The guy is a sinner. But let me mention a statement to you and see if this makes sense. To announce to the blind that the lame can walk is orthodox, but it's not good news. Much of our preaching is announcing to the lame that the blind can see or announcing to the blind that the lame can walk. It's not starting from where the person is hurting. It's not starting from felt knees. Now then the common response is, yeah, but the guy's neither lame nor blind. He's a sinner. That's what's ultimate. That's a given. We're not arguing that one. We're arguing, where do you start from? What do you say to get his attention? Can you take death, burial, and resurrection and relate it to where the guy hurts. Let me give one more example, and uh, Henry here and I have discussed this uh, as it relates to Latin society, uh, to uh, Hispanics, particularly in the Mexican environment of San Antonio. Let me give one more example, and then see if we can draw some examples for, for campus ministry of what we're talking about here. Uh, when a man looks for a wife 
in the Latin context, he looks for a woman that's a virgin. That's the number one requirement. And that she be the mother of his sons. Sons. And the model of that is Mary, who is both virgin and mother of God. And what more could you want in a model? And someone who is at the same time virgin and mother. That's why she's a perpetual virgin. That's why she never had any kids, because it fits their system. It must fit. They're not working out of the text. They're working out of their culture. Now then, man, uh, male, cannot be a mother. That's a physiological difficulty. Neither that's his need. Okay, that's true. But see, this is from God's viewpoint. And this is what's true in terms of uh, ultimate reality. The guy is a sinner. But let me mention a statement to you and see if this makes sense. To announce to the blind that the lame can walk is orthodox, but it's not good news. Much of our preaching is announcing to the lame that the blind can see or announcing to the blind that the lame can walk. It's not starting from where the person is hurting. It's not starting from felt knees. Now then the common response is, yeah, but the guy is neither lame nor blind. He's a sinner. That's what's ultimate. That's a given. We're not arguing that one. We're arguing, where do you start from? What do you say to get his attention? Can you take death, burial, and resurrection and relate it to where the guy hurts? Let me give one more example. And uh, Henry here and I have discussed this uh, as it relates to Latin society, uh, to uh, Hispanics, particularly in the Mexican environment of San Antonio. Let me give one more example and then see if we can draw some examples for, for campus ministry of what we're talking about here. Uh, when a man looks for a wife in a Latin context, he looks for a woman that's a virgin. That's the number one requirement. and that she be the mother of his sons. Sons. And the model of that is Mary, who is both virgin and mother of God. Now, what more could you want in a model than someone who is at the same time virgin and mother? That's why she's a perpetual virgin. That's why she never had any kids, because it fits their system. It must fit. They're not working out of the text. They're working out of their culture. Now then, man, uh, male, cannot be a mother. That's a physiological difficulty. Neither is it very possible for this to be true. Therefore, he lives a lifestyle of a macho, which means uh, sexual conquest. It means being quick with the tongue in terms of verbal debate between men and being able to, it's called picking at the other fella and leaving him wounded. In terms of uh, how you spend your Saturday nights at the, at the neighbor, in San Antonio at the old, all the SO filling stations have been converted into ice houses, uh, drinking beer. It refers to uh, never revealing yourself. You know, you get in a crowd of people like that, and you're not going to reveal yourself. Because if you let down the, the mask, and there's a book called, uh, well, I won't give you the title, but one of the chapters in it is The Mexican Mask, uh, La Mascara Mexicana, The Mexican Mask. And the idea is that in order to live this kind of a lifestyle, you don't let down your guard, ever. Somebody else will take advantage of you in that kind of a context. And therefore, the lifestyle that you must live says that you can never open yourself up, not even to your wife. Okay, now what kind of attitude is this going to produce on the part of a person? It's going to be 
What would be the one word to describe a person like that that can't reveal himself to anyone? Frustrated. Frustrated, all right. Afraid? Lonely. The name of the book in which the chapter occurs of the Mexican mass is called The Labyrinth of Loneliness, written by a Mexican philosopher. The end road of this is la soledad, loneliness. That's where it all ends up. Now then, in order for a message to be relevant in this context, it needs to say something about loneliness. It needs to say something about being a real man and how to be a real man. It needs to preach a message that shows Jesus not as, uh, as he's called, uh, the child God, Nino Dios. Uh, you go inside a Catholic church building and you'll find various images of Jesus as a child in the arms of his mother as a baby or Jesus in the manger with Mary looking on adoringly. Or you'll find Jesus on the cross with his head hung to one side, dead. Or you'll find El Señor Sepultado, Jesus of the sepulcher, usually in a fancy gold-trimmed casket lined with velvet. Well, where's the living Christ? You see, there's no image of a Jesus that's a man. A Jesus that's tempted sexually. That's almost heresy in a Latin context. But if you begin to preach at Jesus, emphasizing those parts of the gospel that shows that, hey, this guy was a man. I mean, he went in and he turned the temple upside down. He'd walk up to the fellows that every macho in town had tried to put chains on a guy that had an evil spirit, and he'd beat them to a bloody pulp every time. And so here's Jesus just walks up to him and just, you know, puts it right on him. That's the kind of guy Jesus is. He's not some mealy mouth, meek, gentle fellow. You know, he throws out evil spirits. He throws tables over in the temple. That whip probably hit as many people as it hit bulls and goats. This guy's a man. And that's the image that must be presented. And he knew about this. He shows you how to get out of it. Nobody's been as lonely and as isolated as Jesus was. So he's been there and he can take you out of it like he came out of it. So this is another small example of finding out where people are hurting and then slanting the message to those hurts. And it's a demanding message. You know, you're saying, you know, why don't you be a real man? Why don't you take off the mask and quit the charade? And let's be a real man. Let's quit tripping over every woman that comes across your path. Why don't you stand up and say no? And know why? Why don't you quit pushing it off on your flesh? You'll say, God, I'm made out of flesh. You know, I'm just a man. You know, that's no excuse. God knows you're already made out of flesh. And that's no excuse. So stand up and be responsible. Live responsible. Live like a man. That's a message that has an appeal, I think, to us to a Latin, a Latin context. Henry, you might have a, a word or two to add to that. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, in a situation like this, this isn't going in the back door. Uh, so often in bus programs, you know, uh, you get the kids coming and then you get the mother coming, <coughs> maybe. And then you show up at the house. And so there's the guy over there watching the Monday night fights with a can of Coors in his hand. And, then, and, and you're trying, you've already come in the back, you've already ruined your approach with a fella because you haven't been man enough to confront him with what's going on. And you've tried to get in through his kids and then through his wife and now you want to say something to him and he's not going to listen. If you're going to have something to say, you're going to have to say it. The problem is the solution. Okay, this is the problem. It's also the solution. And you're going to have to hit it head on. So one of the solutions of the campus ministry might be to figure out what it is that we're the most afraid of. Can I kind of go with that? And say go with it. Hit it. Yeah. My understanding, I've been, uh, I've lived the last 13 years on the college campus, either as a student or a campus minister. And I see really a resurgence of materialism today uh, on 
campus. Uh, you know, it's not to go out and serve humanity, it's to go out and make the big bucks. Right. Uh -huh. And how would you, do you just, do you hit that? Is that what you're saying? Do you, do you give Jesus' words about treasures in heaven? Or am, am I going the right direction? Yeah, I think this is the way that, that you would go to say that, you know, that, that that's been tried before. Uh, Malcolm Muckridge has a lot to say about this. He was, uh, do, are you, have you heard of Malcolm Muckridge? Yeah, he was sure. a, okay. The journalist. Yeah, the yeah. BBC uh, broadcaster. And he has a beautiful address that was given to the University of Edinburgh where he served as rector. And one of his jobs as rector was to deliver requests to the students to the administration. And their request was to have birth control pills distributed with the morning milk. And he said, I'm not going to give you that. And he resigned as rector. And, and uh, in this book, uh, Rediscovering Christ, is a chapter that is his speech resigning before the student body and saying, I could put up with anything out of students. It's the hope of tomorrow. To see students, you could come up with any kind of a radical idea, and I would buy it. I'd go along with you. But you come up with a solution of any 60-year-old debauchee bed and boots. And he said, I'm really disappointed. Looks like you could come up with something. That's been tried. And I think this might be a message maybe for materials. You know, that's, that's not where meaning is. That's not where purpose is. And I think we have to deal with it directly. And I agree with you that this is the resurgence on campus. Of, uh, that's why the biggest department at ACU is the, uh, the business administration. Now, I won't tell you how many Bible majors they've got. And my question then is, but the, uh, you know, the fellow who's really involved in making the best grades, so he can get the best job, so he can make the most money, he doesn't really, his need to be fulfilled there is the money. He's got some idea that money makes him significant. Yeah. You know? yeah. Now, do you, I mean, you obviously don't meet my need by telling him better ways to make money. Right. Okay. So how do you meet that need that he's feeling? You see what okay. I'm yeah. Okay. The need, the need is totally different. Okay. Let's go back to this deal of uh, the guy trying to be a macho in a, in a Latin context, and see the way the society, the way the society has told him to go about it, is false. He has to wear a mask, and it takes so much effort and pressure to keep the mask on. It's it's a <coughs> tremendous burden to have to bear. When Dan Coker preached this message in Santiago, Chile, he had young men coming up to him and said, you don't know what a relief it is to know I don't have to wear that mask. Keep up that image. So your society is giving you ways to meet that felt need, which are false. They're not going to work. So the need is, you know, to find some sort of purpose and direction and meaning in life. And they're trying to plug it with materialism. I would say the real need isn't making money. The, the need is having purpose and direction and meaning in life, and they're trying to plug it with materialism, and it's not going to fill the hole in their reality. So you'd say your significance does not come from how much money you make. Right. It's only another right. element or significance. From which and again, you know, if, when you begin to move in this direction and have people make that kind of a change, uh, like Henry was talking about, these new people that are constantly coming in, and having a message that, you know, I don't have to do that anymore, and confessing that before people, and then that helps others come out of that. So as you get people coming in out of that context of, okay, you know, that was a farce to try and get my meaning and reality out of, out of material possessions, and that doesn't work, and I'm glad to know it. As they begin to confess this and share with others, then, you know, it's a mushrooming effect. Then others can see. And then even we can see. Yes. The real blessing is when you can talk to that student and help him realize that if he gives away that materialism, he has a greater blessing. Right. Uh, that, that will solve. He still can have drive. He can have the greatest blessing of all by giving it away. Right. And we have to preach this with power and conviction. See, the trouble with a lot of us is that, you know, We'd really like to have the gumption to make that kind of money too, but we majored in the wrong thing. <laughs> and so it's kind of hard. It's like us there with the evil spirits in Guatemala. It's kind of hard to preach. You know, nobody's going to believe if it's all ifs and maybes and perhaps and, you know, this could be and maybe. Have you thought about it this way? You know, if you don't preach with some sort of conviction. And the way you get the conviction, the way I maintain some sort of a conviction, 
is again to keep that contact with people, with these new converts that are coming in, constantly reinforcing that. I said, man, I've had it. I've tried it. It doesn't work. Those are the guys that reinforce me. But, uh, get, and again, you know, the hardest thing is to get the ball rolling, to get it started. But, uh, well, you have people like uh, Kip McKean that gave up a pre-med major for what he's into now. You know, $100,000 a year. I doubt he's making that in, uh, in Boston. So, you know, we have people like this around. And, and, you know, they found meaning and purpose and direction in life. Uh, there's a book called Why Conservative Churches Grow. And uh, it was written by a liberal Methodist. Uh, Kelly, and his thesis is that uh, conservative churches grow because they demand things out of people, discipleship. And he says, if you're selling the meaning of life, purpose and direction, if you're selling it cheap, the world knows subconsciously that you're selling them a bill of goods because the meaning to life doesn't come cheap. So if you're not, you know, that's, that's part of the whole process here. If, you, if you're selling the meaning and purpose of life, if that's your bill of goods, and he says that's exactly what we're supposed to be about, that's what salvation is, you know, getting us turned around in the right direction and knowing how we're supposed to be spending our time and how we spend our life, it's a tremendous felt need. Now then, the difficulty is, you know, what do you do with the people that, that feel like their needs are being met with materialism? And... Uh, you know, all I can say there is, uh, you know, not everybody's going to believe. And I, I wish I had something better to say. But let me get the reaction of some of the others of you to, uh, to, the, to the question that, that he brought up. What do you see as, as felt needs on the campus? Or what do you see that, that people are striving for? Where are they coming from? Yes. If it feels good, do it. Uh, you know, responding to your, you know, just basic desires. And, uh, you know, yeah, experiential. And, you know, God made you this way. You know, they even throw God in there and say, that yeah. God made us this way. Yeah. yeah. We have these desires. Why not satisfy them? Yeah. You know, and, and, and Paul had something to say about that in, <laughs> in Corinth. You know. Yes. You know, the, the materialism idea, uh, I, I look at it, it's, uh, they're success oriented. And the world right now, success is money. Uh, you know, maybe years ago it was uh, you know, smarts or something. You know, mm -hmm. you had degrees as long as you are or whatever. And you were successful, you made big bucks or not. Uh, that, you know, I see as it, it's very successful. And, and, you know, this idea of being somebody. And I, I, don't, I try to gear it to what really is successful in God's eyes. Okay. Okay, I think we can take it back. I think what God has given us will work here in this life. In other words, if our gospel doesn't help me get more out of life right here and now, then I have faith and trust that there's pie in the sky, and I believe it with all my heart. But I would hate to think that Christianity is just sticking it out so that you get the reward later on. And I know it's got good stuff right here and now. And, you know, I would like to say to people that, you know, what really is success? Are you going to get to be 40 years old or 65 years old and look back over your life and cry your heart out because you spent your life for the wrong thing? You know, now's the time to think about that kind of stuff, not when you get 65. Get it in the right direction now. Yes? Uh, maybe an example shows in the film it would be like John Ehrlichman it's, uh, in the Watergate thing a lot of those people and I'm not holding them up yeah, by no yeah. means a lot of those people will say now that uh, that money meant nothing and that power that prestige or whatever means so little there are more important things in life yeah what can you do with fame after you get it eat it you know it's not yes what about those who uh, don't want to face reality and so they try to escape temporarily alcohol and drugs uh, I would say, you know, I don't, know, I don't have a lot of answers. I wish I did. But I keep coming back to if drive them back into it in the sense of, you know, where's this stuff coming out to? 
you know, what kind of solution are you really getting out of that kind of a lifestyle? That's what you're saying is every person makes an assumption about what makes his life significant. Right. Everybody makes an assumption. Uh, some person's assumption may be, in order to be significant, I must have a day every week. Or I'm, in order to be significant, I must make a lot of money. Or I must make an A in this, uh, I must make all A's in school. Or maybe their assumption is, I'm not significant, so to keep from facing that, I'll, I'll nest myself with drugs and alcohol. Yeah, yeah. And I guess what you have to do is find that basic assumption that they're living on and try to show the irrationality of it. Right, Does and that, that, that Je yeah, that Jesus has a better, a better solution. Let me throw out another problem for you to tackle. <laughs> We work a lot with Japanese students, and uh -huh. it's so, you know, the concept of the family is so important, and to mm -hmm. bring honor to the family and everything that you do. Right. And w when we present the gospel, that tears them away from their family. Okay. And that's, you know, the need is for them to, uh, yeah. to fit into the family. Okay, what we did in Guatemala, we had the same concept. The ancestors are not my ancestors, they're our ancestors, they're community property. And if one guy in the community becomes a Christian, oftentimes the whole community is on top of him because the ancestors are going to get mad at us, not you, us. And so you have the whole community putting pressure on the guy to make him not become a Christian. And if a guy becomes a Christian, like an 18-year-old becomes a Christian, well, the idol table is over there in the corner of the house, and he's, he's forced to see it. It's there. The evil spirits are with it. you know, And that's the environment. And this may sound uh, unbiblical. I hope not. We have counseled 18-year-old boys. Before you make a decision, and for certain, before you're baptized, you go back to your dad and you tell him you haven't made any decision yet, but you've got somebody that you would like to arrange a meeting with a family for. And then it's presented to the whole family. And it's presented to the man of the house. And it's explained to him. So that the whole family can become a unit. This is true in Latin society in particular. You know, It's not a problem. It's the solution to greater growth. Instead of getting... A, you know, the, uh, the list that I showed you of people that were baptized in, uh, in, uh, in Shehuyut, they were coming in groups of four, groups of six, groups of twelve, groups of twenty. And you look out the date they were baptized, all baptized on the same date. That's not the problem. That's the solution to greater growth. Just be patient a minute and see if you can get that whole family unit in. And then they can, if you get two or three families, they can withstand the community pressure because they can help each other withstand the pressure. You get one guy, and it's, oh man, it's tough. It's almost impossible. So, I would say try to get back in with the family and encourage that person to, before they make a commitment, a firm commitment that's going to isolate them, to try and reach that family. You know, the trouble is if there's students here and the family's back over there, that's, uh, you know, I wish I knew. Well, yes? I, I don't know, you know, a situation like that where they're here and the family's back. Uh, maybe stressing the, the family concept that they're going to be a part of the family when they make the decision. Not that they're going to be right. If okay. This is true. That, might, I mean, that would be good. The promise of, that Jesus makes that we will have many more parents and brothers and sisters. Right. Okay. You're coming up with a lot of good ideas. I just uh, the example that Bill brought up is just something that I've been dealing with right now. I've been studied several hours with one guy. And he said if he was to stay in America, he would become a Christian, and uh, and he's he's a believer. But he just can't understand how he can go home to his Japanese family and his dad. You know, he never yeah. is so distant from him. It's not a very personal relationship. Right. He really fears that. Right. And, what, and I told him, well, would his dad, you know, receive the gospel? He said he didn't know. But he wants me to come over there and teach <laughs> his family. Yeah. And then he thinks then maybe he can become a Christian or okay. maybe when he's respected in society. Okay. And, you know, this is a problem when you're converting 20 year old fellas here on campuses, and they're going back into some societies where you don't have any right to speak, not any right to be listened to until you're 60. You know, you, you've got, but still, it can be done. You can approach people in such a way that you approach them as a lo role of a servant and a learner, and you can be listened to with a proper approach. Uh, 
And, you know, somebody mentioned even in bus programs, don't get the idea I'm against bus programs, but uh, someone suggested that the next time some of these uh, young kids want to be baptized, it would be better to take the confession, drive them back across town, take the confession on the street corner where they live. Because that's where it's going to have to be lived. Because oftentimes there's a dichotomy that develops of becoming Christian in one environment. Even in the Indians, we hesitated to baptize people down on the coast, on the finca, plan on the plantations, while they were working, because they're going to have to live their Christianity back home. We'd rather have them go home, tell their friends and their neighbors, and make their confession there, because we've seen a lot of cases where they were Christians only on the coast. And when they went back home, it was a different environment and a different world. So in terms of doing evangelism with international students, I think you really need to be tuned in to these people's felt needs. Now, they got one set of felt needs as a foreign student just for somebody to show them some understanding and some love and some concern. And that'll work fine for here. But it's not going to hold them over when they go back home. And the gospel has to be presented in terms that are felt needs in the, the cultural context of where they're going to have to live this when they go back. And that is a big bite to chew off okay uh, I think yes one more comment uh, when a whole family embraces Christ do you still go through the the, uh, the father and the maturing growth process of others even after they leave, uh, they leave home yes uh, uh, particularly the father in Kiche society the woman is not religious uh, she's in favor of religion but uh, it's the man who knows all the chants. It's the men who are the witch doctors. It's the men who do all of the, the incantations and everything. And as long as the woman is there doing the cooking for the fiestas, and as long as the woman is present, you know, she doesn't have to understand anything. It's just as long as she's there, it'll all work. And so you get women becoming Christians, and they sit on the back row and talk because, you know, this is the way you do religion. As long as you're there, you don't have to understand. And so, you know, it's a real education process to get women in Quiche society to come to real faith in Jesus, real depth of faith. Well, let me make a suggestion that we found it really works. And I'm, I think all college students ought to try this. Get in world Bible school. The reason, if you get letters from Ghana, Kenya, Nigeria, uh, Singapore, or wherever, you have all these varied backgrounds, and instead of being forced to give a quick answer, you can think through, go ask for some help, and you can learn a lot on how to relate to people and deal with these questions then that will give you the strength to know how to go out and talk to the international students on the campus in a way that you won't have otherwise. I think that's really good. We've got a few students. I wish we'd get all of ours involved in that. Mm -hmm. but I see a great maturing over about five or six months as a result. Okay, that sounds like a good idea. Do you have a comment? Okay. All right, well, thank you very much for your questions and for your comments. Uh, you stimulated my thinking today, so I appreciate it. It's been good to be with you.